one and all, once again, back to Exploring Arda, a Tolkien-centered podcast where I am your host, Jackson, and I go through a bunch of Tolkien's works other than Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Now, this is the, I think, fourth part of uh, the fall of Numenor. I have been um, very, <laughs> I very much enjoyed it so far, and uh, even the last chapter didn't have a whole lot of... Uh, adventure or exciting bits uh it does add to the lore the history of Numenor and the connection it has with Middle Earth uh, especially with um Elendil obviously um being the first back uh uh returning group I guess to Middle Earth which is is important so of the Dúnedain and whatnot uh, but this one will be focusing on um, the first part here, it says the Aregion founded by the Noldor. And I know that I've done a lot of like the intros very quickly and trying to push my uh, other projects into the front here. So, of course, I have to keep doing that. <laughs> so you think I wouldn't do it. So be sure to check out my book, The Lands of Ordia, Power of Heaven on Amazon. Uh, it is my... Uh, my own personal huge huge project um one out of five books so far <laughs> done but you know hey it's a start so check it out i would greatly appreciate it and also check out uh the bookworm cinema productions which has three shows which uh, includes this one audio version um so exploring arda books and baggins another tolkien one where we just read through lord of the rings and also uh drink and dried i almost i don't know why i almost forgot <laughs> drink and dried which is pretty much a nerdy podcast with me and my buddy so check it out if you can i would greatly appreciate it but we will go back here into the fall of numenor because that's what you guys came here for so <laughs> so let's just get right into the story so a region founded by the noldor galadriel became aware that sauron again as in the ancient days of the captivity of melkor morgoth had been left behind or rather since sauron had yet had as yet no single name and his operations had not been perceived to proceed to proceed from a single evil spirit, prime servant of Melkor. She perceived that there was an evil of controlling purpose abroad in the world, and that it seemed to proceed from a south source further to the east, beyond Eriador and the Misty Mountains. Calib Caliborn and Galadriel therefore went eastwards, about the year 700 of the Second Age, and established the primarily but by no means solely Noldoran realm of Eregion. It may be that Galadriel chose it because she knew of the dwarves of Khazad-dûm, Moria. There were and always remained some dwarves on the eastern side of Erlindon, where the very ancient mansions of Nagrad and Belagas had been, not far from Nenuel, but they had transferred most of their strength to Khazad-dûm. Caliborn had no liking for dwarves or of <laughs> no dwarf. Oh wow, hold on, I gotta restart that. Caliborn had no liking for dwarves of any race as he showed to Gimli in Lothlorien, and never forgave them for their part in the destruction of Doriath. But it was only the host of Nagrad that took part in the assault, and it was destroyed in the battle of Sarn Athran. The dwarves of Belagost were filled with dismay at the calamity, and fear for its outcome, and this hastened their departure eastward to khazad Thus the dwarves of Moria may be presumed to have been innocent of the ruin of Doriath and not hostile to the elves. In any case, Galadriel was more far-sighted in this than Celeborn, and she perceived from the beginning that Middle-earth could not be saved from the residue of evil that Morgoth had left behind him, save by a union of all the peoples who were in their way and in their measure opposed to him. She looked upon the dwarves also with the eye of a commander, seeing in them the finest warriors to pit against the orcs. Moreover, Galadriel was a Noldo, and she had a natural sympathy with their minds and their passionate love of crafts of hand, a sympathy much greater than that found among many of the Eldar. The dwarves were the children of Aule, and Galadriel, like the other of the Noldar, had been a pupil of Aule and Yvanna in Valinor. Galadriel and Celeborn had in their company a Noldoran craftsman named Celebrimbor, said to have been one of the survivors of Gondolin, who had been among Turgon's greatest artificers. Celebrimbor had an almost dwarvish obsession with crafts and he soon became the chief artificer of Eregion, into a close relationship with the dwarves of Khazad-dûm, among whom his greatest friend was Narvi. Both elves and dwarves had great profit from this association, so that Eregion became far stronger, and Khazad-dûm more, far more beautiful than either would have done alone. 
The building of the chief city of Eregion, Austin Edil, fortress of the Eldar, was begun in about the year 750 of the Second Age, the date that is given in the Tale of Years for the founding of Eregion by the Noldor. Um, hmm. I'm going to continue this whole section and then I'll talk about it. So, <laughs> Continuing on. In the year 750, Calibrimbor established in Eregion a brotherhood of elven master craftsmen called the Gwaith e Myrdane, the people of the jewel smiths. It is written in the Silmarillion that they surpassed in cunning all that they had ever wrought, save only Feanor himself, and indeed greatest in skill among them was Calibrimbor. Narvi was a dwarvish craftsman whose workmanship, in collaboration with Celebrimbor, would be discovered by the Fellowship of the Ring when they sought a way through Moria. They are confronted by closed and hidden doors whose presence is eventually revealed by the light of the rising moon together with graven emblems of the houses of Durin and Fanor, wrought in Ithildin that mirrors only starlight and moonlight, together with the inscription in the elven tongue of the west of Middle-earth in the Elder Days. The doors of Durin, Lord of Moria, speak friend and enter. I, Narvi, made them. Calibrimbor of Holland drew these signs. The signs and inscription were evident evidence of a supreme fortune that had once been possessed by the dwarves of Khazad Doom, as Gandalf explained. The wealth of Moria was not in gold and jewels, the toys of the dwarves, nor in iron, their servant. Such things they found there, it is true, especially iron, but they did not need to delve them, delve for them. All things they all things that they desired they could obtain in traffic. For here alone in the world was found Moria silver, or true silver as some have called it, Mithril in the elvish name. The dwarves gave a name which they do not tell. It, it, its worth was ten times that of gold, and now it is beyond price, for little is left above ground, and even the orcs dare not dwell here for it. Sorry, make sure there. Mithril. All folk desired it. It could be beaten like copper, and polished like glass, and the dwarves could make, make of it a metal, light and yet harder than tempered steel. Its beauty was like to that of common silver, but the beauty of Mithril did not tarnish or grow dim. The elves dearly loved it, and among many uses they named it Ithildin, Star Moon which you saw upon the doors. So, now I can do a little bit of a break there, and sometimes, my apologies, my laptop just kind of like dims down, so. Uh, yeah, uh, I really, really love the character of uh, Calibrimbor, and obviously if you have played um, consoles or PC or any of that stuff, uh, you will recognize Calibrimbor as like the supposed crafter, uh, pretty much the helper or the crafter of the other elven rings of power. So, interesting to come back to him, um, back to this, and I actually did forget that um, it is... Um, <laughs> It is Calibrimbor and his buddy Narvi that made the, pretty much the speak friend and enter, you know, uh, the little riddle in the hidden door for Moria, which is, yeah, it just kind of takes me back. It's like, yeah, that was him, wasn't it? <laughs> so even like, uh, even in Lord of the Rings, there's things that go all the way back um, here. And I just love that for me, for this show, I can go back and trace all the histories and all the stories back to things that like I know very well or maybe perhaps you guys know it's I just love making those connections and being like cool that's really really cool and how they did it and also that um, Galadriel was a pupil of both Aule and Yavanna only makes sense <laughs> and so and then there's of course uh, Caliborn who isn't really my favorite <laughs> he's <laughs> He's, he's a bit of a, a jerk. <laughs> um, he's he, I, I get that he's important, but man, he's like... Mm, he's, he's not my favorite dude, so... <laughs> just because of his um, absolute, just, like, dwarves. No, get him out here. Because they, they ruined Doriath, and like, yeah, sure they did, but it's not all of them, you know? like. <laughs> but I could, I, mean, I could probably go into that, but probably not for this tale, so... We're going to just go on into the next segment, which is called Aldarion and Arendis. So, here we go. The sea longing came anew upon Aldarion, who we actually read about last chapter, uh, son of Mel Meneldur, fifth king of Numenor. And he departed again and yet... Hold on. And he departed again and yet again from Numenor. And his mind turned now to ventures that might not be compassed with one vessel's company. Therefore he formed the Guild of Venturers, that afterward was renowned, 
To that brotherhood were joined all the hardiest and most eager mariners, and young men sought admission to it even from the inland regions of Numenor, and Aldarion they called the Great Captain. At that time, he, having no mind to live upon land in Ar Menelos, had a ship built that would serve to his dwelling place. He named it therefore Aambar, Sea Dwelling, and at times he would sail in it from haven to haven of, nu of Numenor, but for the most part it lay at anchor off Tol Uinen. Yeah, Uinen, <laughs> and that it was a little isle in the Bay of Ramena that was sat there by Uinen, the Lady of the Seas. Upon Aambar was the Guild House of the Venturers, and there were kept the records of their great voyages. For Tar Meneldor looked coldly on the enterprises of his son, and cared not to hear the tale of his journeys, believing that he sowed the seeds of restlessness and the, the desire of other lands to hold. In that time, Aldarion became estranged from his father, and ceased to speak openly of his designs and his desires. But Almerion, the queen, supported her son in all that he did, and Meneldor perforce let matters go as they must. For the venturers grew in numbers and the esteem of men, and they called them Uinendili. Ooh, Uinendili. Yeah, sure, I don't know. <laughs> the lovers of Uinen, and their captain became the less easy to rebuke or restrain. The ships of the Numenorians became ever larger and, and of greater draught in those days, until they could make far voyages, carrying many men and great cargoes. And Aldarion was often long gone from Numenor. Tar Menildur even ever opposed his son and set a curb on the felling of trees in Numenor for the building of vessels, and it came therefore into Aldarion's mind that he would find timber in Middle-earth, and seek therefore a haven for the repair of his ships. In his voyages down the coast he looked with wonder on the great forests, and at the mouth of the river that the Numenorians called Guathir, River of Shadow, he established Vinyalonde, the new haven. But when nigh on eight hundred years had passed since the beginning of the Second Age, Tar Meneldor commanded his son to remain now in Numenor, and to cease for a time his eastward voyaging. For he desired to proclaim Aldarion the king's heir, as had been at that age by the heir of the kings before him. Then Meneldor and his son were reconciled for that time, and there was peace between them, and amid joy and feasting, Aldarion was proclaimed heir in the hundredth year of his age, and, and received from his father the title and power of Lord of the Ships and Havens of Numenor. To the feasting in Armenelos came one Beragar, from his dwelling in the west of the isle, and with him came Arendis, his daughter. There Almerion the queen observed her beauty, of a kind seldom seen in Numenor, for Beragar came of the house of Beor, by ancient descent, though not of the royal line of Elros, and Arendis was dark-haired and of slender grace with the clear gray eyes of her kin. But Arendis looked upon Eldarion as he rode by, and for his beauty and splendor of bearing, she had eyes for little else. Thereafter, Arendis entered the house of the queen, and found favor also with the king. But little did she see of Aldarion, who busied himself in the tending of the forest, being concerned that in days to come timber should not lack in Numenor. Ere long the mariners of the guild of venturers became restless, for they were ill content to voyage more briefly and more rarely under lesser commanders. And when six years had passed since the proclamation of the king's heir, Aldarion determined to set sail again to Middle-earth. Of the king he got but, but grudging leave, for he refused his father's urging that he abide in Numenor and seek a wife, and he set sail in the spring of the, of the year. But coming to bid farewell to his mother, he saw Arendis among the queen's company, and looking on her beauty, he divined the strength that lay concealed in her. Then Almerion said to him, Must you depart again, Aldarion, my son? Is there nothing that will hold you in the fairest of all mortal lands? Not yet, he answered, but there are fairer things in Armenelos that a man could find elsewhere, even in the lands of Eldar, of the Eldar. But mariners are men of two minds, at war with themselves, and the desire of the sea still holds me. Um, yeah, I'll continue because there is, I'll let you guys quick, if you guys are on YouTube here, you guys can check out the paintings, um, pretty much of Alan Lee, the depiction I'm assuming uh, of the, oh man, I'm already blanking on the name. <laughs> the ship, the Oenin, there you go. No, sorry, Aambar, there you go. Aambar is the ship that <laughs> that Eldarion captains, I suppose, in their harbors and stuff. Uh, but uh, on goes with the story, I would say. 
Arindus believed that these words were spoken also for her ears, and from that time forth her heart was turned wholly to Aldarion, though not in hope. In those days there was no need, by law or custom, that those of the royal house, not even the king's heir, should wed only with the descendants of Elros Tar Minyatur. But Arendus seemed that Aldarion was too high. Yet she looked on no man with favor thereafter, and ever, every suitor she dismissed. Seven years passed before Aldarion came back, bringing with him ore of silver and gold. And he spoke with his father of his voyage and his deeds. But Meneldor said, Rather would I have had you beside me than any news or gifts from the Dark Lands. This is the part of merchants and explorers, not of the king's heir. What need have we of more silver and gold, unless to use in pride where other things would serve as well? The need of the king's house is for a man, who knows and loves this land and people, which he will rule. Do I not study men all my days? said Eldarion. I can lead and govern them as I will. Say rather some men of like men with yourself, answered the king. There are also women in Numenor, scarce fewer than men, and save your mother, whom indeed you can lead as you will. What, what do you know of them? Yet one day you must take a wife. One day, said Eldarion, but not before I must, and later, if any try to thrust me towards marriage. Other things I have to do more urgent to me, for my mind is bent on them. Cold is the life of a mariner's wife, and the mariner who is single of purpose and not tied to the shore goes further, and learns better how to deal with the sea. Further, but not with more profit, said Meneldor, and you do not deal with the sea, Aldarion, my son. Do you forget that the Edain dwell here under the grace of the lords of the west, that Uinen is kind to us, and Ossay is restrained? Our ships are guarded, and other hands guide them than ours. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so be not overproud, or the grace may wane. Or, and do not pres presume that it will extend to those who risk themselves without need upon the rocks of strange shores or in the lands of men of darkness. To what purpose, then, is the gracing of our ships, said Aldarion, if they are to sail to no shores and may seek nothing but not seen before? He spoke no, mo <laughs> he spoke no more to his father of such matters, but passed his days upon the ship Aeombar in the company of the venturers and in the building of a vessel greater than any made before. That ship he named Palaran, the far wanderer. Yet now he met Arendus often, and that was by contrivance of the queen. And the king, learning of their meetings, fell, felt disquiet, yet he was not displeased. It would be more kind to cure Aldarion of his restlessness, said he, before he win the heart of any woman. How else will you cure him if not by love, said the queen. Arendus is yet young, said Meneldur, but Almarion answered. The king of Arendus have not the the length of life that is granted to the descendants of Elros, and her heart is already won. So, I'm going to do a little bit of a break here, because this is actually kind of a longer story than I thought. Um, <laughs> I think this is going to be the whole chapter, if not... Yeah, it's going to be the whole chapter, so... <laughs> so, we get the, um, pretty much the defiance of Aldarion against his father. He does not want to marry. He is literally pretty much married to the sea. <laughs> that is all he really cares about, is venturing out into there. And despite his father being the king, he still wants to go out there and do what he wants. You know, he's trying to be that, I wouldn't say like a rebellious phase, but he's just like, listen, like, it's cool that you are <laughs> in control of the land, but I love to be out in the sea. But obviously the king is just like, well, yeah, you like to be out in the sea, but it is also a Nguinen who pretty much govern the seas and it's because of them that we are able to actually um, be protected in this island so and they keep trying to push Arendus toward Aldarion to wed them and it's kind of like back and forth back and forth so um but yeah yeah that's, that's pretty much all that it is I would say like shorthand that's kind of what's going on so back to it here again now when the great ship Palaran was built Aldarion would depart once more at this, Meneldor became wrathful, though by the persuasions of the queen he would not use the king's power to stray him, or to stay him. Sorry, there must be told of the custom that when a ship departed from Numenor over the great sea to Middle Earth, a woman, most often of the captain's kin, should set upon the vessel's prow the green bow of return, and that was cut from the tree. Oh, <laughs> Oyolari, Oyolari. Wow, oh, that's a that's a tough one. <laughs> that signifies ever summer which the Eldar gave to the Numenorians, saying that they set it upon their own ships in token of friendship with Ossé and Uinen. The leaves of that tree were evergreen, glossy and fragrant, and it throve upon sea air. 
but Menildur forbade the queen and the sisters of Eldarion to bear the bow of Oileri to Remena, where lay the Paleron, saying that he refused his blessing to his son, who was venturing forth against his will. And Eldarion, hearing this, said, If I must go without blessing or bow, then so will I go. Then the queen was grieved, but Arenda said to her, Tarinya, my queen, if you will cut the bough from the elven tree, I will bear it to the haven by your leave, for the king has not forbidden it, forbidden it to me. The mariners thought an ill thing that the captain should depart thus. But when all was made ready and men prepared to wait anchor, Arendas came there, little though she loved the noise, and bustled the great harbor and the crying of the gulls. Aldarion greeted her with amazement and joy, and she said, I have brought you the bow of return, lord, from the queen. From the queen, said Aldarion, in a changed manner. Yes, lord, she said, but I asked for her leave to do so. Others beside your own kin will rejoice at your return, as soon as may be. At that time, Eldarion first looked on Arendus with love, and he stood long in the sterns, looking back as the Palaron passed out to sea. It is said that he hastened his return, and was gone less time than he had designed. And coming back, he brought gifts for the queen and the ladies of her house, but the richest gift he brought for Arendus, and that was a diamond. Cold, sorry, sorry, cold now were the greetings between the king and his son, and Menildur rebuked him, saying that such a gift was unbecoming in the king's heir, unless it were a betrothal gift, and he demanded that Aldarion declare his mind. In gratitude I brought it, said he, for a warm heart amid, amid the coldness of others. Cold hearts may not kindle others to give, to give them warmth at their goings and comings, said Menildur, and again he urged Aldarion to take thought of marriage though he did not speak of Arendus. But Aldarion would have, n have none of it, for he was ever in every course the more opposed as those about him urged it. In treating Arendus now with greater coolness, he determined to leave Numenor and further his designs in Vinyolande. Life on land was irksome to him, for aboard his ship he was subject to no other will, and the venturers who accompanied him knew only love and admiration for the great captain. But now Menildur forbade his going, and Aldarion, before the winter was fully gone, set sail with a fleet of seven ships and the greater part of the venturers in defiance of the king. The queen did not dare incur Menildur's wrath, but at night a cloaked woman came to the haven bearing a bow, and she gave it to the hands of Aldarion, saying, This comes from the Lady of the Westlands, for they called Arendus, and they went away in the dark. At the open rebellion of Aldarion, the king rescinded his authority as lord of the ships and havens of Numenor and he caused the guildhouse of the venturers on Aeombar to be shut, and the shipyards of Remena to be closed, and forbade the felling of all trees for ship shipbuilding. Five years passed, and Aldarion returned with nine ships, for two had been built in Vinyolande, and they were laden with fine timber from the forests of the coast of Middle-earth. The anger of Aldarion was great when he found what had been done, and to his father he said, If I am, if, if I am to have no welcome in, in Numenor, and no work for my hands to do, and if my ships may not be repaired in its havens, then I will go again, and soon, for the winds have been rough, and, it, and I need refitment. Has not a king's son ought to do but study <laughs> to study a woman's face to find a wife? The work of forestry I took up, and I have imprudent it. There will be more timber in Numenor ere my day ends than there is under your scepter. And true to his word, Aldarion left again in the same year with three ships and the hardiest of the venturers going without blessing or bow. For Menildor set a ban on all the women of the house and of the ventures and put a guard about Ravenna. All right, so I'm gonna do a quick thing here. Uh, well, so, I mean, they, okay, so between Aldarion and the king, there is so much stubbornness. <laughs> I mean, Aldarion is very, very stubborn not to choose a wife but then at the same time it's like his his love is for the sea and for the adventurings and he goes to middle earth a lot especially to this vinyolande place that he established which appears to be doing pretty good <laughs> especially when he keeps coming back and you know I, I mean sure it's like years apart um but then obviously the king is like urging him to have a wife because when he gets supposedly supposedly he wants him to be crowned king his his son then he actually, then it's a king and queen instead of just just a, a king. I suppose that's why he's urging him so much to find a wife. So it's just a lot of back and forth, and the ban on the, the trees was kind of like. <laughs> I mean, he knows you know that the king's serious about it when there's like a whole bunch of banning and like 
he's getting more strict, basically, with Eldarion, so it's interesting to see that. So, um, back to the story here. On that voyage, Eldarion was away so long that the people feared for him, and Menaldor himself was disquieted, despite the grace of the valor that had ever protected the ships of Numenor. When ten years had gone since his sailing, Arendus at last despaired and believed that Eldarion had met his met <laughs> had met with disaster. There you go, or else that he had determined to dwell in Middle Earth, and also in order to escape the Im importuning there you go of suitors, she asked the queen's leave, and departing from Armenelos, she returned to her own kindred in the Westlands. But after four years more, Eldarion at last returned and his ships were battered and broken by the seas. He had sailed first to the haven of Vinyolande, and thence he had made a great coastwise, coastwise journey southwards, far beyond any place yet reached by the ships of the Numenorians. By returning northwards he had met contrary winds and great storms, and scarce escaping shipwreck in the Harad, found Vinyolande overthrown by great seas and plundered by hostile men. Three times he was driven back from the crossing of the Great Sea by high winds out on the west, and his own ship was struck by lightning and dismasted, and only with labor and hardship in the deep waters did he come at last to Haven in Numenor. Greatly was Menaldor confronted at Eldarion's return, but he rebuked him for his rebellion against his king and father, thus forsaking the guardship of the Valar and risking the wrath of Asse, not only for himself, but for men whom he had bound to himself in devotion. Then Eldarion was chastened in mood, and he received the pardon of Menaldur, who restored to him the lordship of the ships and havens, and added thereto the title of Master of the Forest. Eldarion was grieved to find Arendus gone from Armenelos, but he was too proud to seek her, and indeed he would not do well to <laughs> would not well do so save to ask for her in marriage, and he was still unwilling to be bound. He set himself to the repairing of the neglects of his long absence, for he had been nigh on twenty years away, and at that time great harbor works were put in hand, especially at Ramena. He found, he found that there had been much felling of trees for building and the making of many things, but all was done without foresight, and little had been planted to replace what was taken, and he journeyed far and wide in Numenor to view the standing woods. Riding one day in the forest of the Westlands, he saw a woman whose dark hair flowed in the wind and about her was a green cloak clasped by the, at her throat with a bright jewel, and he took her for one of the Eldar, who came at times to those parts of the island. But she approached, and he knew her for Arendus, and saw that the jewel was the one that he had given her. Then suddenly he knew in himself the love that he bore her, and he felt the emptiness of his days. Arendus, seeing him, turned pale and went right off, but he was too quick, and he said, Too well have I deserved that you should flee from me, who have fled so often and so far. But forgive me, and stay now. They rode then together to the house of Beragar, her father. And there Eldarion made plain his desire for betrothal to Arendus. But now Arendus was reluctant, uh, though according <clears throat> according to custom and the life of her people, it was now full time for her, for her marriage. Her love for him was not lessened, nor did she retreat out of guile. But she feared now in her heart that the war between herself and the sea for the keeping of Aldarion she would not conquer. Never would Arendus take less, that she might not lose all, and fearing the sea, and begrudging to all ships the felling of trees which she loved, she determined that she must utterly defeat the sea and the ships, or else be herself defeated utterly. Alright, and yeah, before I do this, uh, before I continue on, I should say, so Aldarion is finally back in Numenor after <laughs> A troublesome uh, venture throughout the the coasts of Middle Earth, but he does not seem to have the the blessing pretty much uh, that the Eldar usually give. So it is supposedly because of this um, safe trinket of his that he comes back all pretty much like weather worn, and his ships are torn and splintered and what uh, just broken pretty much. And he's like, okay, fine, you know what? I'll come back here. I'll stay here. And then he pretty much realizes that even with the pardon of his father that that he does come across Arendus and he says like okay maybe I should settle down <laughs> and, ma and marry her so but with so much time that's like 20 years that he was away Arendus is like well I don't know maybe <laughs> I think she's kind of like reluctant about it so which makes sense I, I would completely understand that so 
Um, but yeah, that's kind of what happens. So on we go with the story. But Aldarion, sorry, but Aldarion wooed Arendus in earnest, and wherever she went, he wherever she went, he would go. He neglected the havens and the shipyards and all the concerns of the guild of venturers, felling no trees but setting himself to their planting only, and he found more contentment in those days than in any others of his life, though he did not know it until he looked back long after when old age was upon him. At length he sought to persuade Arendus to sail with him on a voyage about the island in the ship Aambar. <clears throat> so, excuse me. Got something there. For 100 years had now passed since Aldarion founded the Guild of Adventurers, uh, Adventurers, sorry, just Adventurers, and feasts were to be held in all the havens of Numenor. To this, Arendus consented, concealing her distaste and fear, and they departed from Romena and came to Andunier in the west of the isle. There, Valendale, lord of Andunier and close kin of Aldarion, held a great feast, and at that feast he drank to Arendus, naming her <laughs> Uineniel, there you go, daughter of Uinen, the new lady of the sea. But Arendus, who sat beside Nuneth, the wife of Valandil, said aloud, Call me by no such name. I am no daughter of Uinen. Rather is she my foe. Thereafter, so yeah, thereafter for a while, doubt again assailed Arendus, for Aldarion turned his thoughts again to the works at Remena, and busied himself with the building of great sea walls and the raising of a tall tower upon Tol Uinen. Kalmindan, the light, the light Tower, was its name. But when these things were done, Aldarion returned to Arendus and besought her to be betrothed. Yet still she delayed, saying, I have journeyed with you by ship, Lord. Before I give you my answer, will you not journey with me ashore to the places that I love? You know too little of this land for one who shall be its king. Therefore they departed together and came to Amerie, where, where where were rolling downs of grass, and it was the chief place of sheep pasturage in Numenor. And they saw the white houses of the sh farmers and the shepherds, and heard the bleeding of the flocks. There Aranda spoke to Aldarion and said, Here could I be at ease. You shall dwell where you will, as wife of the king's heir, said Aldarion, and as queen in many fair houses, such as you desire. When you are king, I shall be old, said Arendus. Where will the king's heir dwell meanwhile? with his wife, said Aldarion, when his labors allow, if she cannot share in them. I will not share my husband with the Lady Oenin, said Arendus. That is a twisted saying, said Aldarion. <clears throat> As well might I say that I would not share my wife with the Lord Os sorry, with the Lord Arome of Forest, because she loves trees that grow wild. Indeed you would not, said Arendus, for you would fell any wood as a gift to Oenin if you had a mind. Name any tree that you love, and it shall stand it till it dies, said Aldarion. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I love all that grow in this isle, said Arendus. Then they rode a great while in silence, and after that day they parted, and Arendus returned to her father's house. To him she said nothing, but to her father Nuneth she told the words that had passed between herself and Aldarion. All or nothing, Arendus, said Nuneth. So you were as a child, but you love this man, and he is a great man not to speak of his rank, and you will not cast out your love from your heart so easily, nor without great hurt uh, for yourself. A woman must share her husband's love with his work and the fire of his spirit, or make him a thing not lovable. But I doubt that you will ever understand such counsel. Yet I am grieved, for it is full time that you are wed, and having born a fair child, I have hoped to seek fair grandchildren. For if they were cradled in that king's house, that would displease me. This counsel did not indeed move the mind of Arendus. Nevertheless, she found that her heart was not under her will, and her days were empty, more empty than in the years when Eldarion had been gone. For he still abode in Numenor, and yet the days passed, and he did not come again into the west. Now Almarion the queen, being acquainted by Nuneth <coughs> with what had passed, and fearing lest Eldarion should seek solace in voyaging again, for he had been long ashore, <coughs> sent to Arendus asking that she return to Armenelos. And Arendus, being urged by Nuneth and by her own heart, did as she was bid. There she was reconciled to Aldarion. And in the spring of the year, when the time of the <laughs> of the Eru er, the Eru Kyrme, that one's always so so difficult, <laughs> was come. <coughs> before I interrupt again, <laughs> they ascended in in the retinue of the king to the summit of the Metal Tarma, which was the hollowed mountain of the Numenorians. 
must be placed there. When all had gone down again, Aldarian and Rendis remained behind, and they looked out, seeing all the island, Isle of Westerness laid green beneath them in the spring. And they saw the glimmer of light in the west, there far away was Avalone, and the shadows in the east upon the great sea, and the metal was blue above them. They did not speak, for no one, save only the king, uh, spoke upon the height of metal Tarma. But as they came down, Arenda stood a moment, looking towards Emerie em and beyond towards the woods of her home. <laughs> Do you not love the oh, Yozayan? Wow, that's a weird word. Okay. <laughs> the Yozayan. I love it indeed, he answered, though I think that you though I think that you doubt it. For I think also of what it may be in time to come. Sorry. And the hope and splendor of its people. And I believe that a gift should not lie idle in hoard. But Arendus denied his words, saying, Such gifts as come from the Valar, <clears throat> and through them from the One, are to be loved for themselves now, and in, and in all nows. They are not given for barter, or for more, or for better. The Edain remain mortal men, Aldarian. Oh, sorry. They rem the Edain remain mortal men, Aldarian, though they, may, though they be. And we cannot dwell in this time that is to come, lest we lose our now for a phantom of our own design. Then, taking suddenly the jewel from her throat, she asked him, Would you have me trade this or buy, to buy me other goods that I desire? No, he said, but you do not lock it in hoard, yet I think you set it too high, for it is dimmed by the light of your eyes. Then he kissed her on, her, on the eyes, and in that moment she put aside fear and accepted him, and their troth was plighted upon the steep path of the middle tarm. Alright, so, after a long reading there, because this is a very, very long tale, um, which uh, I might actually... <clears throat> I'll try to finish it this episode. It'll be a little longer. So, um, obviously, after so many attempts, I would say so many attempts by Aldarian, he kind of gives up on her. <laughs> which, I mean, you know... He, but then at the same time, like, she waited for him for years and years and years. And um, I'm getting a bit of a cold because I have to sit next to a, <laughs> a, a window here and it's very cold today, but eventually, between the Queen and um, and Arendus' mother, uh, Nuneth, they eventually get them together at the one of the Iluvatar's <laughs> celebrations and feasts and whatnot, <coughs> and she finally... Oh, I got something in my throat, so I hope I finish it soon. But finally, they she pretty much ends up being like, okay, fine, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Now it's okay, so back to the story here so that I can <clears throat> possibly um, <clears throat> fix something in my throat here, so, because, man, it's, it's hurting, so. Here we go. They went back then to Armenelos, and Aldarian presented Arendus to Tar Menildor as the betrothal of the king's heir, and the king was rejoiced. And there was merrymaking in the city and all the isle. As betrothal gift, Menildor gave to Arendus a fair portion of land in Emerie, and there he had built for her a white house. But Aldarian said to her, Other jewels I have in hoard, gifts of kings in far lands to whom the ships of Numenor have brought aid. I have gems as green as the light of the sun, and the leaves of trees which you love. No, said Arendus, I have had my betrothal gift, though it came beforehand. It is the only jewel that I have or would have, and I will set, set it yet higher. Then he saw that she had caused the white gem to be set as a star in a silver fillet, yeah, okay. And at her asking, he bound it on her forehead. She wore it, she wore it so for many years, until sorrow befell. And thus it was known far and wide as Tar, Tar Elestirne, the Lady of the Starbrow. <coughs> and thus there was for a time peace and joy in Hermenelos, in the house of the king, and in all the isle. And it is recorded in ancient books that there was great fruitfulness in the golden summer of that year, which was the 858th of the Second Age. But alone among the people, the mariners of the Guild of Venturers were not well content. For fifteen years Aldarian had remained in Numenor and led no expedition abroad. And though there were gallant captains who had been trained by him, without the wealth and authority of the king's son, their voyages were fewer and more brief, and went but seldom further than the land of Gilgalad. Moreover, timber was become scarce in the shipyards, for Aldarian neglected the forests, and the venturers besought him to turn again to his work, to this work. 
At the repair, Aldarion did so, and at first Arendus would go about with him in the woods, but she was saddened by the sight of trees felled in their prime, and afterwards hewn and sawn. Soon, therefore, Aldarion went alone, and there were less in company. Now the year came in, which all looked for the marriage of the king's heir, for it was not the custom that betrothal should last much longer than three years. One morning in that spring, Aldarion rose up from the haven of Andunie to take the road to the house of Beregar, for he was, for there he was to be guest, and thither Arendus had preceded him, going for Armenelos by the roads of the land. As he came to the top of the great bluff that stood out from the land and sheltered the haven from the north, he turned and looked back over the sea. A west wind was blowing, as often as that season, beloved by those who had minds to sail to Middle-earth, and white-crested waves marched towards the shore. Then suddenly the sea longing took him as though a great hand had been laid on his throat, and his heart hammered and his breath was stopped. He strove for the mastery, and at length turned his back and continued on his journey, <clears throat> and by design he took his way through the wood where he had seen Arendus riding as one of the Eldar, now fifteen years gone. Almost he looked to see her so once more, but she was not there, and desired to see her face again, hastened him, so that he came to Beregar's house before evening. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry guys, I, I don't know, I am becoming sick, so, I guess like as a quick thing, even though he is very, very much loved with Arendus, the, the sea uh, still calls to him, um, <coughs> with so many years, and obviously with the the guild of ventures they're like well without him you know they don't really go out as much because he's the one that really sparked everything together with the the super long voyages the voyages in middle earth the founding of was it the vinyolande in middle earth i mean he did all these things and now he's just like settling down oh sorry <laughs> settling down uh for marriage and uh, i guess some of the people just don't really like that so <laughs> And then obviously he's going over to be a guest and he's just like kind of like looks out to the sea and he's just like man i you know he you can tell that he, he misses it so uh but now we just go right back into the story uh once again so there she welcomed him gladly and he was merry <coughs> uh, <coughs> oh man something really caught there but he said nothing touching their wedding though all had thought that this was part of his errand to the westlands as the days passed, Arendus marked that he had now fell often. Wow, he now often. <laughs> there you go. Fell silent in company uh, when others were gay, and he and if she looked towards him suddenly, she saw his eyes upon her. Then her heart was shaken, for the blue eyes of Baldarian seemed to grow now gray and, and cold. Yet she perceived, it, as it were, a hunger in his gaze. That look she had seen too often before, and feared what it boded, but she said nothing. At that, Nuneth, who marked all that passed, was glad, for wood, words may open wounds, as she had said. Ere long, Aldarion and Arendus rode away, returning to Armenelos, and as they drew further from the sea, he grew merrier again. Still he said nothing to her of this trouble, for indeed he was at war with himself, and ir irresolute. There you go. So the year drew on, and Aldarion spoke neither of the sea nor of wedding, but he was often in Ramena and in the company of the venturers. At length, when the next year came, the year, <coughs> the year, wow, when the next came in, next year came in, the king called him to his chamber, and they were at ease together, and the love they bore one another was no longer clouded. My son, said Tar Menildur, when will you give me the daughter that I have so long desired? More than three years have now passed, and that is long enough. I marvel that you could endure so long a delay. Then Aldarion was silent, but at length he said, it has come upon me again, Atarinya, father. Eighteen years is a long fast. I can scarce lie still in a bed, or hold myself upon a horse, and the hard ground of stone wounds my feet. Then Middledur was grieved, and pitied his son. But he did not understand his trouble, for he himself had never loved ships. And he said, Alas, but you are betrothed. And by the laws of Numenor, and the right ways of the Eldar in a dame, a man shall not have two wives. You cannot wed the sea, for you are affianced to Arendus. Then Aldarion's heart was hardened, for these words recalled his speech with Arendus as they passed through Amerie, and he thought, but untruly, that he she had consulted with his father. It was ever in his mood if he thought that others combined to urge him on some path of his choosing, of their choosing, to turn away from it. 
Smiths may smithy and, hordsmen and horsemen ride, and miners delve when they are betrothed the city. Therefore, why, why may not mariners sail? If smiths remained five years at the anvil, few would be smiths' wives, said, king, said the king, and mariners' wives are few, and they endure what they must, for such is the livelihood and their necessity. The king's heir is not a mariner by trade, nor is he under necessity. There are other needs than livelihood than, a, than drive a man, said Eldarion, and there are yet many years to spare. <coughs> Nay, said Beldor. Well, <coughs> oh, sorry, guys. You may take your grace for granted. Oof. Arendus has shorter hope than you, and her years wane swifter. She is not of the line of Elros, and she has loved you now many years. She held back well nigh twelve years when I was eager, said Aldarion. I do not ask for a third of such time. And I'm actually going to pause it right now. She was not then betrothed, said Meneldur. <clears throat> but neither are you are now free. And if she held back, I doubt that it was not in fear of what now seems likely to befall. If you cannot master yourself. In some way, you must have stilled that fear. And though you have spoken no plain word, you are, you are beholden as I judge. Then Aldarion said in anger, It were better to speak with any betrothed myself and not hold parley by proxy. And he left his father, not long after he spoke to Arendus of his desire to voyage again upon the great waters, saying that he was robbed of all sleep and rest. She sat pale and silent. At length she said, I thought that you were come to speak of our wedding. I will, said Aldarion. It shall be as soon as I return, if you will wait. But seeing the grief in her face, he was moved, and a thought came to him. It shall be now, it shall be, it shall be before this year is done. And then I will fit out such a ship as the ventures made never yet, a queen's house on the water. And you shall sail with me, Arendus, under the grace of the Valar, of Yvanna and of Arome, whom you love. You shall sail to lands where I shall show you such woods as you have never seen, where even now the Eldar sing, or forests wider than Numenor, free and wild since the beginning of days, where still you may hear the great horn of Arome, the Lord. But Arendus wept. Nay, Aldarion, I rejoice that the world yet holds such things as you tell of, but I, sh I shall never see them, for I do not desire it. To the woods of Numenor my heart is given, and alas, if for love of you I took, the sh I took ship, I should not return. It is beyond my strength to endure, and out of sight of land I should die. The sea hates me, and now it is revenge that I kept you from it, and yet fled from you. Go, my lord, but have pity, and take not so many years as I lost before. Then Eldarion was abashed, for as he had spoken in heedless anger to his father, no s <laughs> oh, wow. to now she spoke with love. He did not sail that year, but he had little peace or joy. <clears throat> Out of sight of land she will die, she, he said. Soon I shall die, if I see it longer. Then if we are to spend any years together, I must go alone, and go soon. He made ready, therefore, at last for sailing in the spring, and the venturers were glad, if none else in the isle who knew of that was done. Three ships were manned, and in the mouth of Verese they departed. Arendus herself set the green bow on the, of, of the Oilary on the prow of the Pelarion, and hid her tears until it passed out beyond the great new harbor walls. Six years and more passed away before Aldarion returned to Numenor. He found even Almarion the queen colder and welcome, and the venturers were fallen out of esteem, for men thought that he had treated Arendus ill. But indeed he was longer gone than he had purposed, for he had found the haven of Vinulande now wholly ruined, and great seas had brought to nothing all his labors to restore it. Men near the coast were growing afraid of the Numenorians, or were become openly hostile, and Aldarion heard rumors of some lord in Middle-earth who hated the men of the ships. Then he would turn for home. A great wind uh, came out of the south, and he was borne far to the northward. He tarried a while in Mithland, but when his ships stood out to sea, once more they were again swept away north, and driven into ways perilous with ice, and they suffered cold. At last the sea and wind relented, but even as Aldarion looked out in longing from the prow of the Palarin, and saw far off the mental Tarma, his glance fell upon the green bow, and he saw that it was withered. Then Aldarion was dismayed, for such a thing had never befallen the bow of Oyolari, so long as it was washed with the spray. It is frosted, Captain, said the mariner, who stood beside him. It has been too cold. Glad am I to see the pillar. Then Aldarion sought out Arendus. She looked at him keenly, but did not come forward to meet him. And he stood for a while at a loss for words, as was not in his want. 
Sit, my lord, sit, said Arendis, and first tell me of all your deeds. Much must you have seen and done in these long years. Then Aldarin began haltingly, and she sat silent, listening. While, she told all, while he told all the tale of his trials and delays, and when he ended, she said, I thank the Valar, by whose grace you have returned at last. But I thank them also that I did not come with you, for I should have withered sooner than any green bough. Your green bough did not go into the bitter cold by will, he answered. But dismiss me now if you will, and I think that men will not blame you. Yet dare I not to hope that, our, that your love will prove stronger to endure even than fair Oilary. So it does prove indeed, said Arendis. It is not yet jilted to the death, Aldarion. Alas, how can I dismiss you when I look on you again, returning as fair as the sun after winter? Then let spring and summer now begin, he said, and let not winter return, said Arendis. And that is the end of the chapter. <laughs> I would say this is basically a whole chapter, a big story, and it's not even uh, done yet because it actually goes on saying the, the wedding of Aldarion in Arendis, and that goes on for a, a while. <laughs> so that's probably going to be uh, either a one part, a very long one long part, or a two parter parter of the book, but um. If I didn't do a lot of breaks in between, it is mainly because uh, I feel myself becoming sick, so I am trying to finish the episode as fast as I can, <laughs> which isn't really ideal, but you know, it happens. So, basically, what happens between uh, between the two is that Aldarian wants f always he just wants to be out on the sea, always uh, at all times, and whenever he goes, I suppose. Well, the more inland he gets, like, you know, the more happier he gets with her, but then, like, internally, he's still drawn out to the sea, so he's like, listen, I, I can I can marry you, but I can also build a ship, and then you can just live out in the sea with me. It's like, oh, come on, dude, like, that's not really kind of how, how it works. And, um, <laughs> and Arendus is just like, well, I know that, you know, the sea has no, you know, like, uh, like... She, she can't win against the sea because the sea is always at his heart, always pulling at him. But finally, when he goes out, like, I would probably say, like, the last time he does not have a lot of luck on his side. Obviously, the frozen um, green bow comes back, and then he's probably like, oh, that's probably why. But either way, that's like, his adventurers, his adventure ring, I should say, are slowly, slowly coming to a halt where, you know, at first he was just up up back and forth back and forth all the time and now it's kind of slowed and he's becoming more upset about it so but we will finish the tale <laughs> uh probably in the next chapter because it has been a long story so far but glad to have some progress in the book so far so some great progress so far in the year uh pretty soon i should be probably reading one of the uh, I would say short stories, <laughs> short stories of Tolkien, one of the other ones that don't take, you know, like 10 or 15 parts to finish. So <laughs> we'll see how that um, pans out in the future. So, um, but yeah, end of the episode, which means <laughs> that I need to plug my own book, The Lands of Ordia, uh, The Power of Heaven, or not, sorry, The Lands of Ordia, Power of Heaven. And the last couple of episodes I've been kind of stammering over my words, kind of stumbling over them. Don't know why, just some recordings are better than others. So, But anyway, check out In the Lands of Ordia. Uh, I have written the first one. It is on Amazon. And I would just greatly appreciate it if you guys would check it out because I, I put a lot of lore and a lot of history. I'm, I keep neglecting to add to my language building. <laughs> so I still need to do that and work on that. But hopefully by the end of the series, I will have it completed. But be sure to check it out because uh, it's it's hard to pretty much get your story out. So, yeah. <laughs> I think with all that being said, just uh, stay tuned for another episode. And may the light of Elbereth be with you all. Farewell.